Well, I really believe today is going to be the beginning of a real healing in your life, healing in your family, healing in our cities, our nation, in our world. And because we're going to believe God for emotional healing, for soul healing, soul cure, soul health. When your soul is healthy, everything's healthy in your life. And I really believe that's the secret to what's going on in the world today, what's been going on in the world for years and years. We need a real healing and looking to Jesus is our source, is the greatest source of all for healing. And he's the same yesterday, today and forever. So we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look to Jesus and we're going to look for Jesus and we're going to find him everywhere and we're going to find him healing you. We're going to find him in your home. We're going to find him wherever you go today. We're going to find him there because he is always with you and he's going to heal you. And I pray for that healing power to work in your life today. I want to pray for you at the end of the service. So let me talk about this in John, Chapter 13, verse 23. There was leaning on Jesus bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Of course, he loved all of his disciples, including you and me. But John knew that he was loved. He knew that Jesus loved him. Lord, love me. That was the heart cry of John the Apostle. Lord, love me is our heart cry today. This love which comes from our beautiful Savior is the secret to all that ails mankind. It it finds what's lost. It fills what's empty. It fixes what's broken. It frees what's bound. Boy, when you get a hold of that, you'll never be the same. So before we go any further, I want you to know that the purpose of today's teaching is to serve as our North Star. There's so much pain in this world. As we all know, the soul of humanity is sick in so many ways. Mental health, soul health has been overtaken with soul sickness, mental anguish, people living stress filled lives. We all know what it's like to suffer from some sort of emotional pain, don't we? We bleed when we get injured, whether in our bodies or in our hearts. And it hurts and God knows and he is with you right now to heal you. But if you multiply that hurt and consider a world filled with millions who bleed, a planet filled with illness, fear and anxiety, tragically, more than one million people commit suicide every year and more than 20 million attempt it and fail. That's a staggering number. There's no doubt about it. Mental disease is an epidemic that we are facing and we have to cure. And remember, the statistics, these statistics are based simply upon people who admit the problem and do not include those who are suffering silently. Are you one who's suffering silently right now? Because Jesus is going to heal you loudly where you are suffering silently. But I I think knowing these statistics will really help us because and I hate to lay it on you, but there are 20 million Americans battling addiction right now, 10 million who are victims of domestic violence, 8 million who are suffering from eating disorders, not to mention thousands, the thousands of homicides and suicide victims between the ages of five and and 24, 25 years old, the thousands of elementary school children who are hurting themselves, cutting their skin, burning themselves, pulling their hair out, punching themselves. Why are they doing that? It's a desperate attempt to cope with stress, with loneliness, with anxiety, with fear. They're in severe emotional pain and attempting to numb it. You know, on the opposite end of the spectrum, attempting to feel something, anything. They're trying to just feel something. And this is nothing new or original in today's culture. If you look back 2000 years to Mark, Chapter five. Look at what it says in Mark, Chapter five, verse five. It says, and always night and day, this man was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. These emotional epidemics are proof that the heart of humanity has been overtaken by soul sickness and all the misery it creates. But that's what the church is for, to introduce people to the real Jesus, right? The one who heals the soul. And here's how he's going to do it. I'm going to give you five ways that Jesus is going to heal your soul today. Look at Proverbs chapter 15. I love this verse. It says eyes that focus on what is beautiful bring joy. Eyes that focus on what is beautiful bring joy to the heart and hearing a good report refreshes and strengthens the inner being. That's Proverbs 15. Verse 30, another translation says good news makes 
for good health. New Living Translation. Good news makes for good health. Eyes that focus on what is beautiful bring joy and calm and peace and refreshing inside and out. We all need the good news that makes for good health, don't we? We need joy for our hearts and strength in our inner beings. And so over the next few minutes and the next few weeks and the next few months and years, I'm going to help you focus on what is truly beautiful, because what we focus on shapes our soul. What we focus on shapes our soul. I believe step one to your soul's health. And I'm dedicating this month to to soul health, soul cure, curing your soul. Whether you get my book or not, you're going to get healing and you're going to experience soul cure, the healing of our soul, the healing of our nation. Number one step, the number one step is feed your soul beauty and it will heal itself. Feed your soul beauty and it will heal yourself. You're taking notes. This is number one. Feed your soul beauty and it will heal itself. I believe that every bit of healing that we need in our heart, in our soul, in our mind, in our emotions, every bit of healing we need in this world starts with focusing on what is truly beautiful. God wired us for beauty to heal us. And Jesus is the most beautiful thing in the universe. When you begin to know him as he wants to be known the way he truly is, there will be no stopping this goodness, this peace, this joy. You think about it. This world's news feeds us so much of what is dark and ugly and destructive. And I pray that cycle stops, that we start viewing life through the lens of God's beauty. Most of us see his beauty every day, but don't recognize it or we don't make the connection. So our minds remain on the negative as our norm and our emotions take on that negative mindset. We have to feed our soul's beauty and our souls will begin to heal. You know, one of the most famous passages of scripture, Jesus gives us the cure for anxiety. Notice what Jesus says. He says, therefore, I tell you, Stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy or distracted about your life. Now, most people, this is Matthew, chapter six, verse twenty five. Most people miss the cure. He goes on to say in verse twenty six, look at the birds of the air. He says, look at the birds. He said, look at the lilies, look at the birds. Yes, he wants us to see that our father feeds them. But more importantly, I believe he wants us to see the beauty of his creation. Jesus goes on to say, look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothes in verse 28. Again, Jesus is giving us the secret to mastering our emotions. In this case, worry and anxiety. He's saying all it takes is what we're looking at. What we're looking at is going to heal us of worry and anxiety or what we're looking at is going to create worry and anxiety. So we got to choose what we're going to look at. I believe when we focus on the beauty of Jesus, there's so much right now. You look at social media, even there's so much right now you can be looking at to discourage you to feel defeated, to feel negativity, to feel pain. But I believe beauty is the signpost from our creator. Beauty brings people to Jesus. The beautiful Christ invites you to share in his life, in his love, to become flooded with his unrivaled goodness, his matchless wisdom. The beautiful Jesus invites you to experience his presence, his healing hands. One glimpse of his brilliance can reshape our entire existence. I want you to see something here. The multitudes prayed, Lord, feed me. They were aware of their hunger. The disciples prayed, Lord, lead me. They were aware of their need for direction. But John prayed, Lord, love me. Lord, love me. Lord, love me. He was aware of God's beauty. What is it that John saw? What is it that drew him to Jesus bosom? Think about it. No angry God would draw someone to their bosom. I want you to see this. This is step two in healing our souls of negativity and pain. Invite Jesus to love you. Number two, invite Jesus to love you. Number one, feed your soul beauty and it will heal itself. Number two, invite Jesus to love you. In fact, let's do number step number two right now. Just pray this. Jesus, I invite you to love me. I invite you to show me your love. I invite you to heal me. 
I invite you to show me your beauty. I invite you to heal me every place I'm I'm hurting. Invite Jesus to love you. Did you do that? Let's keep going. You see, no. No punisher, disciplinarian, abuser, herder or hater or indifferent God would ever create that kind of warmth and devotion that draw John to his bosom. But we have a distorted view of Jesus, unfortunately, because of religion. So many Christians grew up with a checklist, right? The rules and the demands that they have to be met to be acceptable to God. Many people right now watching me, you've been raised with the idea that God is some sort of dictator just waiting if you step out of line so he can put you back in place. That's not our heavenly father. I heard all these things about God before I discovered him as the most beautiful. You see, a wrong concept of God is the greatest problem in the world today. It's what causes the violence. It's what causes the fear. It's what causes all anger. It's what causes all strife because it repels people. Failure to understand how truly beautiful that Jesus is keeps us distant from him. When we can't feel a warm God, when we can't see a God who is warm and embracing and wants to adore you. My hope is that you're going to catch a glimpse of how beautiful Jesus truly is today, because when you do, it will change the trajectory of your life and it will truly cause you to come into a collision <laughs> with happiness. One glimpse of this beautiful savior and what's ever restless and painful in your soul is going to subside. The true knowledge of Jesus is every human's greatest need and it's every source of our greatest happiness to be mistaken about him. Not believing in God is, is not the most tr the worst tragic thing in the world, but to be mistaken about him is the worst tragedy in this world, to be mistaken about him, to think that he's against you when he's for you. Boy, and the devil is such a hijacker, isn't he? He just tries to hijack and distort the true image of Jesus, to paint a wrong picture of him. In fact, since the beginning of creation, the enemy has been vandalizing this true picture of God, the goodness of God, the beauty of God. Why? Because he knows that if you were to discover the real Jesus, your soul would be completely healed from the brokenness, the pain, the loneliness, the anxiety, the fear you feel. Think about this. What if someone broke into the gallery in Florence, Italy, where Michelangelo's statue of David is and they sprayed graffiti all over it? What if someone broke into the Louvre where the Mona Lisa painting is and painted a mustache or a beard on her? The pure beauty of these masterpieces would be vandalized. Their value would be diminished. They wouldn't mean as much to us. And that's what the devil's done in the middle of the dark night that any that you might be experiencing the dark ages that we experience. He managed the enemy managed to vandalize our our image of Jesus. And suddenly religion created a concept of a God who is angry and distant from us. But that's not who our savior is. Never once. I got to tell you, never once in my first third, 20 or 30 or even 40 years on Earth did I ever hear anyone talk about the beauty of God, the beauty of Jesus. I never heard the idea that everything precious, everything true, everything beautiful and everything good is found in him. Never once did anyone tell me that he is altogether lovely. No wonder I searched for meaning and fulfillment in everything except him before I met him. But when I began to discover how truly beautiful Jesus is, and I'm telling you, I knew just a small glimpse of it early on in my Christian life. But the most that I've learned about the beauty of Jesus is really recently in my life. In the last two or three years, I started to truly know and love and worship him as my most beautiful savior, as my beautiful savior, rather than serving him as my Lord and master, which he is Lord. The idea, though, that I could lose everything, the idea that as long as I have him, I have everything. This is the secret to a healthy 
soul. So let's keep going. We got two steps so far. Number one, we need to feed our soul beauty, the beauty of Jesus. And because as we feed our soul beauty, it will heal itself. And number two, we need to invite Jesus to love us. And number three, the third step in healing our soul is we must realize the gospel is not a set of rules to live by. Christianity is not a set of rules to live by. Christianity is a intimate relationship with a beautiful savior. The Bible is the greatest work of art. Why? Because it paints in story form throughout its pages. It paints in story form the beauty of Jesus. The problem in our world today, honestly, is preaching the Bible as a set of rules and laws that can never change the human heart or life. That's not God's way. The Bible is a map pointing to the greatest treasure of all time, Jesus and his matchless love. Think about this. The Bible is not a book of rules. It is a treasure map. And if you remember the pirates, treasure maps, you find a treasure map and you go and you do whatever it takes to find that treasure that's buried somewhere in the ocean. It's buried somewhere at sea. It's buried somewhere in an island. Well, this is a treasure map. The Bible is taking us to Jesus, the matchless lover of our soul. I want you to consider for a moment and we'll talk about this more another time, but the story of two sisters who invited Jesus to their home. You know this story and you know what's amazing about it. He accepted the invitation. They invited him to come over to their house and he accepted the invitation just as he promises he'll accept anyone who invites him. You know, right now, just take a moment. Have you ever invited Jesus into your home? Have you ever invited Jesus into your house? Have you ever, ever invited Jesus into your family? Let's just do that right now. Just pray this. Just say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my home. I invite you into my family. I invite you into my soul. I invite you to be my healer. I invite you, Jesus, I invite you. We invite you, Jesus, into our church where two or three are gathered in Jesus name. He said, there I am in the midst of them. Uh, now we're having some relationship with God. You see, I'm, I'm happy to lead you in these simple prayers. Jesus, love me. Jesus, come into my home, come into my family, come into my marriage, come into my children, come into my business, come into my finances, come in, come in, come in, come in, come in to the secret hidden places in my soul. You know, back to the story of Mary and Martha for a moment. When Jesus arrived at Martha and Mary's home, think about this. One of them was bothered and one of them was free. One of them was in a tizzy. The other one was in love. One of them was at her wits end. The other one was at peace. What made the difference? Because he was in both of their same house. He was in the house of Mary and the house of Martha. It was the same house. What made the difference? Focus. What made the difference? Focus. I really want you to get this. What made the difference? Focus. There are so many things you, that are distracting you right now. That's why most people don't watch even a church service online for longer than 10 or 20 minutes or 10 or 20 seconds for that matter. Focus is what the difference is. Mary was focused on Jesus beauty. She was sitting at his feet. She was listening to the words of wisdom and she was feeling his love coming from him. Martha was focused on what had to be done. Mary was focused on Jesus. Martha was focused on what had to be done, what had to be cleaned, what had to be prepared. I want you to see something. Their entire emotional life was based on one thing, one thing, what they were focused on their entire emotional lives. One was at peace. One was at war. One was happy. One was sad. One was kind. And one was angry. One was listening. One was talking. 
Woo. We'll come, we, got, we got to come back to this. Remind me, we got to come back to this. So the fourth step to healing the soul is focus, focus, focus on the good, focus on what God has said, focus on what Jesus did, focus on Jesus, focus on Jesus, focus on Jesus. Stop focusing on what you have to do. Stop focusing on a list of things you have to get God to do and start focusing on Jesus, this beautiful man, this beautiful savior. What it, what are we preaching? Why are we preaching if we're not preaching Jesus? I want you to look at this passage in Acts chapter eight for a moment. Acts chapter eight, two thousand years ago, an African man from Ethiopia who knew nothing about Jesus was sitting in a chariot on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And at that time, at that very time, he was sitting in that chariot. God sent Philip, the evangelist, to overtake that chariot. And Acts chapter eight, verse 30, it says, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Imagine the timing of this, because God is ordering our steps, right? And all things work together for our good. This guy is reading Isaiah and Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. And the place in scripture which he was reading was this from Isaiah. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth in his humiliation. His justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from this earth? Imagine this eunuch is reading from Isaiah about Jesus. So the eunuch answer, answers Philip and says, I, I got to ask you, who is the prophet talking of himself or somebody else? And in Acts chapter eight, verse thirty five, what a beautiful verse it says. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him, beginning with that scripture, preached Jesus to him. Notice Philip didn't preach commandments. He didn't see scriptures as a book of rules and demands. He found a description of Jesus exactly where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading and he preached Jesus to him. I wonder if Philip would have opened the book to another passage. I believe he would have found the same thing. Jesus. Because the Bible is not a book of rules. It's a picture, a mosaic of Jesus and of his beauty. It's a, you see a piece of it in Genesis. You see a piece of his beauty in Exodus. The Bible is not meant to be read, read linearly where, where you just lin, just linearly read from verse to verse to verse to verse to verse from book to book. It's it's a mosaic. It's got all these pictures of Jesus. We see him as a farmer. We see him as a father. We see him as a servant. We see him as a son. We see him as a healer. We see him as a deliverer. We see him as a teacher. We see him as the one who comes in the middle of the night. We see the, him coming and rescuing his people. We see him as D Moses dividing the Red Sea. We see him as the prophet calling down the power of God from heaven. Every picture of God intervening in man's life is a picture of Jesus. Every picture of in the Bible of God coming into a situation is a picture of Jesus and his beauty. That's why religion is not the answer. Religious people find God tolerable. But if you've been touched by his love, you find him indispensable. See, Jesus is the most beautiful thing and beauty is a signpost. It's a sign to point us to Jesus. Think about beauty for a moment. We all love what's beautiful. Beauty makes us laugh. Beauty makes us cry. Beauty, beauty makes us joyful and come alive. Beauty was never intended to be the ultimate object of our attention. But you think about the beautiful things in this world, whether it's a sunset, whether it's a symphony, whether it's a work of art. These are not the most supreme things in life. These are pictures glimpses of Jesus beauty. 
These things are not the end in themselves. Beautiful things are a means to an end. Beauty is a pointer. It's a foretaste. It's a signpost to point at the ultimate beauty, Jesus. All the beauty in this world, the galaxies, the oceans, music, poetry, every beautiful human being who's ever lived, every human being is beautiful in some way. Every painting, every star, every human, every animal, all these things are finite. All this is beauty that God created. But the one who created it is beauty itself, is beauty himself. If you added all created beauty together, it would still be less than a speck compared to the limitless loveliness of Jesus. So step number four is we need to focus on the good, focus on Jesus. Step number five is the same as step four. <laughs> if you want to heal the soul, focus on this beautiful savior, focus on this beautiful savior. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, looking unto Jesus, looking at him, looking to him, looking for him, looking at him. I'll give you some things to get you focused on looking at him, looking at him, looking to him. My trust is in him, looking at him. I'm focused on him, looking to him. I'm trusting in him, looking for him. I'm expecting him in everything. Think, these three things. Think about this, looking at him. That's what I'm focused on, looking to him. That's what I'm trusting in, looking for him. That's what I'm expecting to see every day of my life, his goodness and his mercy. They follow us all the days. You see, goodness and mercy are simply evidence of Jesus, beauty, evidence of Jesus presence, goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life. Wow. How beautiful is Jesus? Song of Solomon, chapter five verse 16 says he is altogether lovely. He is altogether lovely. Let's describe this beautiful savior and let's take this beautiful savior. You know, the mission statement of Life Changers Church, the first part of it is to introduce people to the real Jesus, to introduce people to the real Jesus. People have been introduced to the wrong Jesus. I myself have introduced people to the wrong Jesus at times in my life, and I hope every moment of the rest of my life is spent introducing people to the real Jesus. Let me introduce him to you. How beautiful is he? Let's think about his hands. How beautiful are his hands as he heals the sick with those hands, cleanses the lepers with those hands, multiplies bread to feed the multitudes with those hands, then pierced. Those hands were pierced for our salvation and our healing. Think about those beautiful hands and then think about how beautiful his feet are, how beautiful are his feet pierced for your sins. After years of walking mile after mile, bringing healing, bringing power, bringing love, bringing salvation to whoever believes how beautiful are his feet, how beautiful is his embrace as children go running toward him to be caught up in his arms and as he lays hands on each of them, blessing them with his sacred and tender touch. How beautiful is his embrace? How beautiful is his prayer when he prays in John 17 that the world would know that the father sent him and that the father loves us the same way that he loves Jesus. How beautiful is his humility when in John chapter 13, verse three, Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power. And upon knowing that, upon knowing that the father had given him power of everything, Jesus didn't take a bow. Jesus didn't even take his throne. Jesus didn't take a victory lap when he was given all the power from the father over all of life. What did Jesus do? He took a towel and he washed his disciples feet. That's humility. How beautiful 
is his handwriting. You know, I've been signing a lot of books in the last few couple weeks and um, just realizing how sloppy my handwriting is <laughs> trying to perfect my no matter how many books I sign, I cannot get a, a final signature that I'm like, OK, that's my signature. It just keeps changing every time it's sloppy every time. But how beautiful must have hit must Jesus handwriting have been when he stoops down in front of the woman caught in adultery and writes something in the in the dirt. I believe he was writing words of peace and words of love to her. Perhaps we don't know what he wrote. We don't know. But how beautiful that handwriting must have been. What would you give for the NFT of that? Right. <laughs> what, what would you give for a picture of that? What his handwriting looked like when he was wrote in the dirt and it set her free. How beautiful is his love when in John 11, verse three through five, when they said, Jesus, the one whom you love is sick. Jesus loved Martha. Jesus loved Mary. And Jesus loved Lazarus. How beautiful is his love? He loves you. How beautiful are his tears when in John, John 11. Remember, he sees Mary weeping. And he's moved deeply. And in verse 35, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible that everybody knows. Jesus wept. How beautiful those tears must have been. How beautiful. Is his brow. As it was pierced through by a crown of thorns and blood came forth for you and for me to be healed, to be set free. The greatest king and the most brilliant mind. Bloodied by a punishing crown that he wore for you and me so that we would have a royal crown, a crown of salvation, the crown of righteousness, the crown of joy, the crown of victory. How beautiful are his eyes that looked at the thief on the cross as his own friend without condemnation and promised that thief today you shall be with me in paradise. Boy, John only saw a glimpse of his beauty and was immediately drawn to his bosom. No wonder David said, I'm asking God for this one thing, only one thing to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty and I'll study at his feet. No wonder Mary sat at his feet, experiencing forgiveness in her soul while the Pharisees, blinded by their own self-righteousness, wanted her dead. You see, John and David and Mary, they all had one thing in common. They caught a glimpse of Jesus beauty and they were changed forever. The moment we awake in heaven, we will catch our first glimpse of Jesus beautiful face and we will be awestruck. Whatever we considered to be beautiful before will seem like dead. Compared with the stunning. Loveliness on Jesus face, as soon as we see that look of perfect, holy love, we will drop to our knees in utter amazement as love and gratitude flood our soul with worship that will last throughout eternity. That's the beauty of Jesus that will heal you. If we will stay focused on this, I'm going to help you. We're going to stay focused on Jesus. Remember, beginning from this scripture, Philip preached Jesus to him. I'm going to introduce you to the real Jesus. I pray that you will get a better revelation than I have. I pray I would get better at it. I pray I'd see him clearer. I pray that his beauty would blow my mind. I pray that his beauty would blow your mind, too, as I prayed with you earlier. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, you just simply say, Jesus, come into my life. Pray that right now. Jesus, come into my life. Be my savior. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe. You are my God. You are my savior. Show me your beauty, Lord. Show me your beauty. Make that your prayer. If you prayed that prayer, would you reach me today? I want to send a book to you absolutely free. My book, The Power of a New Life. It's a Bible study, simple steps 
in this journey now, the next steps in this journey. And my teaching today is from the, my heart to you, from God's heart to you, from my book to you as well. Soul Cure. I pray you get a hold of it or you stay with me for the next several weeks and I'll just keep pouring beauty of God, the beauty of Jesus into your soul. And as you feed your soul beauty, your soul will heal itself. Lord, thank you for your healing touch in every human mind that has been stressed, that has been in pain, that has been anxious, that has been worried, that has been distraught by what's going on in the world, discouraged. God, I pray for healing. I pray for the healing of each person's soul. I pray that each one of us would be caught up with your beauty and focused on what is beautiful and what is good, what is lovely, that we would think on these things. Jesus is these things. And I pray that we would think on these things, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is honorable, whatever is of good report, like Philippians chapter four, verse eight says, think on these things. Jesus is all of those things and all of those things is Jesus. Whew, let's think on these things and I can't wait to see you at our next service. I love you and I can't wait to worship Jesus with you again and introduce you to the real Jesus and you help introduce me to the real Jesus as well as we stay connected. God bless you. I'll see you soon.